All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. It is a little after noon, and if folks come into the waiting room, I will go ahead and admit them, but I want to get the conversation started so that we can um, keep this to an hour. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, joining us for our first leadership lunch hour. This is a new program from the UWM Alumni Association's Future Alumni Network. Um, my name is Abby Straczynski Rojas, and I um, manage all of the student and young alumni programming for the UWM Alumni Association. Um, today we are joined by Kyle Berger, um, a 2012 graduate of Lubar's Lubar School of Business's Master's in Business Administration program. Um, and Kyle's going to be discussing emotional intelligence, which is a, um, a topic that some of you may have heard about, some of you may not. I think most of you probably have, but maybe you didn't know it um, in that exact title. So I think this will be a really fun conversation. Um, <clears throat> the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna turn the, the screen over to Kyle. He's gonna give some background, um, some of what his work is, as well as a little bit of a presentation on emotional intelligence. Um, and then we're gonna open up the floor for the last half of the conversation for um, just some good dialogue. Feel free to keep your cameras on during Kyle's presentation. Um, he will be sharing his screen, so your, your image will be um, small on the side anyways. Um, and then at the end, definitely turn your camera on and feel free to unmute yourself so that we can just have a fun dialogue. This is meant to feel like we are together in the union um, or on campus somewhere having a conversation. So it's really not meant to be like a lecture. So feel free to keep your cameras on, um, mute yourself during Kyle's presentation, then we'll unmute you. Um, at the end so that we can chat. So at this point, I also should mention I am recording this um, and you'll all get a follow-up email towards the end of the week with the recording. You're welcome to share that with your colleagues or classmates, um, as well as a brief survey that we do ask you to fill out so that we can continue to provide meaningful content. So at this time, I will pass it over to Kyle and um, he can take over for the next 20 minutes or so and then we'll open it up for, for conversation. Great. Thanks, Abby. Uh, as Abby said, my name is Kyle Berger. Good to be with you uh, over the lunch hour today. Uh, hope you're doing well. Uh, so I get a quick little background on myself. I've been teaching in the School of Business uh, since 2015. I also work at WCTC in their corporate training center. So I do leadership development, uh, consulting, training, coaching. So I go out and work specifically with businesses. And then I also put on some programs at the college itself, which involves some training and coaching. And then I also have my own business. So uh, it's KB Breakthrough uh, Consulting. And that's also where I do leadership development, uh, consulting, training, coaching. It all started with uh, doing some work on myself years ago and recognizing what do I have uh, passion for, what gives me energy. And what I identified is I really like helping other people succeed. That gives me energy. So I really sort of followed my instinct on that and uh, worked to get myself trained and worked up in that area. And that's sort of how I ended up uh, doing what I do now and how I come to be before you today. So I'm really excited to uh, dig in on this topic of emotional intelligence. I think it's a very important topic for you. And uh, what I'd like to do is we don't have a lot of time. So I'm just going to give you uh, some key things that I want you to know about emotional intelligence, some things that, that I want uh, you to think about, and that will hopefully spur you to continue to learn more about this topic and to continue to uh, develop uh, for yourself as, as you move forward in your career. So emotional intelligence, I think a good starting point is to define what is it. So what is emotional intelligence? It's not about being nice all the time. It's not about being touchy-feely. It's not about being emotional. It is about understanding the relationship between your thoughts and your feelings. And it's about being aware of your feelings and those of others. It's also about being smart with your emotions. So I had that little picture 
in the right hand corner, you know, I talk about the limbic uh, system and the rational brain. They've actually done the research on this. And what they have found is if you are in a situation, and I, I like to talk about it whether, whether you, uh, your emotions are owning you or you're owning your emotions. And so if you're in a situation where your emotions are owning you, or maybe your emotions are getting away from you, they've done the research, they've done the brain scans. And what, it, what happens is, as your thoughts come into your brain through the limbic system and into the rational brain, when you're emotional, it short circuits that process and your rational brain does not work very well. And if you, if you stop to think about it, you know, usually when you're emotional, the, um, that's usually when you're gonna say things you regret. That's usually when, um, you know, you may not make the best decisions. There's actually a scientific reason behind that. And so, you know, just as a, as a base level, uh, that is, is where the value can start to come in for you uh, when we talk about emotional intelligence. The other thing is understanding the relationship between your thoughts and your feelings. So what does a feeling start with? If I was to ask you, what starts a feeling? It starts with a thought. So it's important to understand that if you are ever in a situation where you're feeling a certain way and you want to identify why you're feeling that way, back the train up and take a look at the thoughts that you're thinking because the thoughts that you're thinking ultimately drive your feelings. Now that's on the positive side, that can be empowering once you wrap your, your head around that. Because if, if your thoughts are driving your feelings and if you wanna change how you feel, then you need to change your thoughts. And that is something you have control over and can do. I really like this quote from Maya Angelou. Uh, I'm sure you, you know who she is, you know, American poet, uh, civil rights activist. I think it really does a nice job of, of encapsulating. So I learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Think about that. When you have had a situation where maybe you're emotional, uh, there's been a conflict, um, you know, something that, that's come up that you've had to work through or, or, or you didn't feel good about, a lot of times you don't remember all the details of what's said or what's done, but what you will remember and what the imprint of that interaction will be with you that you will carry around with you is how did that interaction make you feel? So it's really important that you understand that because how people feel when they walk away from an interaction with you, that's what they're gonna carry with them and that's what they're gonna bring back to future interactions with you. So it's really critical that you are, uh, you are cognizant of that. And that's really where emotional intelligence can help you, help tune into to how are you making other people feel and how are you feeling in these situations? So why care about it? You know, why, why is it important? Well, I just told you it, emotional intelligence and, and your grasp of it will directly impact how you interact with other people and how other people feel in terms of when they walk away from those interactions from you, right? So it stands to reason then that that is going to play a big role in what your personal and professional brand is. And ultimately what I'm saying there is it's gonna play a big role in, in, in your reputation. And whether that's fair or not, uh, the reality is, uh, and you'll find this in your career, that perception is reality. So, you know, if you have a good emotional intelligence, you can better tune into what is that perception and better manage it. 
Goldman is he's a gentleman who's done a lot of research on emotional intelligence. So he he actually took a scientific look at it and he said, if you look at the ratio of technical skills, IQ, and emotional intelligence as ingredients of excellent performance, emotional intelligence proved to be twice as important as the others for jobs at all levels. When star performers are compared with average ones in senior leadership positions, nearly 90% of the difference in their profiles was attributable to EI factors rather than cognitive abilities. And the last quote there, there is growing body of research findings that scientifically demonstrates that emotional intelligence predicts how well we perform at home, school, and in the workplace. So the, the nice thing about investing in emotional intelligence and getting better at it is it's not just going to help you at work in your career, which it definitely will, but it'll help you in your life in general. Um, one thing I want to draw your attention to is the, is the second and the third uh, points on this slide. So ratio of technical skills, IQ, and emotional intelligence is ingredients of excellent performance. Emotional intelligence proved to be twice as important. When star performers are compared with average ones in senior leadership positions, nearly 90% of the difference in their profiles of star performers was attributable to emotional intelligence factors. So you might ask yourself, well, why would that be the case? Well, if, if you think about it, as you move up in your career, you're going to get to a point where, for the most part, people are going to be technically good at their jobs. There might be exceptions to the rules, of course. But for the most part, as you move up in your career, you're going to get to a point where people are all pretty good at, at, at the actual doing of their job. So then what's going to separate you from, from the pack? And what they have found and what the research has found is emotional intelligence. And what that really means is your ability to build effective working relationships. So are you able to build good relationships, uh, good working relationships? And emotional intelligence is a key part of that. So again, you know, this is a very high level, but just to sort of give you an idea of, you know, when I say emotional intelligence, what does that mean in terms of how do I know I'm good at it? How do I know I'm effective at emotional intelligence? So here really is a breakdown of when you sort of take a closer look at it, what are the five competencies of emotional intelligence? So the way I want you to look at this is it's like uh, uh, two sides of the same coin. So on one side is the intrapersonal. So that's how you relate to ourself. So that's your self-awareness. How do you regulate yourself? You know, regulate or you, you discipline yourself, regulate your emotions, uh, understanding what motivates you. So that's really about you. So there are two sides of the same coin, but there is an order to how this works. And you first have to really grasp the intrapersonal and the, the relate to yourself and understand those competencies. Because once you do that, then you're going to be able to better understand and relate to other people. But if you don't have a handle on yourself first, you're not going to be able to get a handle on anybody else. So then the other part of that side of that coin is then, then how do you relate to others? So once you understand how you relate to yourself, then it turns outward. So the interpersonal. So, you know, how do I build effective relationships? You know, am I capable of being empathetic and, in, with the people I work with and, and deal with in my life? This is always a, 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 a nice graph I like to show that, again, it's, it's just further research. So they did a survey. When I say leaders, it doesn't, I'm not necessarily talking about whether somebody has people reporting to them or not, just somebody who is considered a, a leader at an organization. And they said, well, how do, you, how do these people typically spend their day? And so they say, well, 9% of the time they're on the phone, 10% email, you know, 
a, a quarter of the time they're working alone. And then they said 58% face-to-face. Now, obviously with uh, COVID, you might in that face-to-face, you'd have to include Zoom and some of the different technologies. And people, and I've, I've shared this slide in, in workshops I've done with businesses and, and people can quibble over the 58%, maybe it's a little bit higher, maybe it's a little under. Generally, I have found that people spend roughly 50% of their day dealing with other people, either one-on-one or in groups. So if that's true, if I'm spending half of my day interacting with other people, whether it's one-on-one in groups, what does that tell me is the most important skill a leader should have? And you might say, well, you have to be able to communicate, uh, you have to be able to build trust, you have to listen, and, and those are all would be good answers. But what I would say, which is really the overarching part to all of this is, and where all what all of those things fall under would be your ability to build good working relationships. And, and you're not going to be able to do that if you don't have a decent grasp on emotional intelligence. Leadership style. So this is just something that, that, that I like to um, share, you know, with, with different workshops that I do or, and, and things that I put to leaders. And I know that, that a number of you are aspiring and you're going, you know, going through your education and just some things for you to think about, you know, and this could apply, it doesn't matter what it is, if you're in a volunteer organization or you're, you know, doing something with a a group of people, how well do you know the people you're working with? Have you taken the time to get to know them? Can you read the situation accurately? Again, this goes this this goes to emotional intelligence. Can you can you read? Can you interpret? Now, if you don't, like I said earlier, if you don't have a good handle on yourself as it relates to that, you're it's going to be tough for you to have be able to tune into it with other people. So it does have to start with you and working on yourself. But can you read a situation accurately? And what I mean by that is, can you look beyond the words of what somebody's saying to you? I mean, what percentage of our communication is nonverbal? It's pretty big. Actually, it's 90%. So think about that. 90% of what you communicate to another human being has nothing to do with what you say and has everything to do with what your nonverbal is saying. So are you tuned into that for yourself and and your nonverbal and how that is communicating to other people? And are you able to tune into other people's nonverbal? So you look beyond the words of what they're saying to you, and you're able to grasp the bigger picture of what's going on. And then success is choosing the style that gets the best results for that situation rather than what you are necessarily comfortable with. So as you learn more about yourself and you invest in developing emotional intelligence, and different leadership skills, you're going to come to learn well, what is, you know, what makes me tick? What's my style? How do I approach things? And a lot of times people make the mistake of thinking, stopping there once they've learned that. And, and that sort of misses the point. The, the point is you wanna learn that about yourself. You wanna then be able to learn that about other people, but then you don't wanna just go with what you're comfortable with you want to flex your style. You want to flex your approach. What is it about how I'm going to approach this situation? What is it about how this person is going to approach the situation? And how do I want to navigate this to ultimately get my desired outcome? And a lot of times that's going to involve you not always handling in the way you're comfortable with, but maybe flexing your approach to get get the desired result. Emotional intelligence is going to play a big role in your ability to do that. So now I think it'd be a good time to open it up with questions. I will say that, um, you know, I I would encourage you as you are thinking about this and, and looking at your careers, 
don't be in a situation where you're out in an interview with somebody and they're bringing up emotional intelligence and that's the first time you've really stopped to think about it. So tune into this a little bit and, and have a, a better grasp of it because it is something that I think people will be looking for uh, because of all the things I shared before about what research has said in terms of how important it is. Also, I would encourage you to um, any time, and, and I give you credit for taking time today, you're busy. So taking time to, to do this, anytime you can take advantage of stuff like this, I would. I don't think there's really any downside to it. You're gonna learn some things hopefully that you can take and use. So even when you go out into your careers, your companies may offer you different trainings and different opportunities, always take advantage of it. There's, there's very little downside to, to doing that. And there are some good books and I'll, I'll share with Abby uh, when I'm done here, but uh, Tr Travis Bradbury is a very good author on emotional intelligence. So it's emotional intelligence 2.0. It's actually an assessment you can take if you, if you want to. And then I've got another really good book that I, I really like. I just finished reading it's It's called Who's Got Your Back by Keith Ferrazzi. And it says it, it, the breakthrough program to build deep trust in relationships that create success and won't let you fail. So it's really a good book. I know I just talked a lot about relationship building and that's an excellent book for how to do that effectively in the workplace. So there I have said my piece. Um, your icebreaker sec, uh, uh, a thing at the beginning, Abby has me hungry for French fries now, but we'll I'll hold off on that. Um, but let's open it up for questions. So I think Abby had said at the beginning, if you go on your uh, toolbar and you bring up participants, you should have the ability to raise your hand and we can just call on you and, and you know, you can unmute yourself and share whatever it is you, uh, you want to ask or any thoughts that you have. And please feel free to turn on your cameras at this time so we can feel like we're all in this conversation together. Um, I will, I will start us off with a question. Um, so what if I spend a whole bunch of time working on myself and I really feel like I've developed, um, a lot of emotional intelligence and I'm bringing that into the workplace. And what if my colleagues cannot reciprocate that? What if they're unwilling to, um, reciprocate those, you know, healthy working relationships? Where does that, any suggestions for kind of pushing people like outside of yourself to, to hone this skill? You know, that's a tough one. I think probably it's a good question. I think that, you know, the fact that you've got, you've improved the skill in and of itself will benefit you in those situations. I don't think you can, you can gently uh, encourage, but it's one of those things where people will have to want to, have to want to do it. Um, so I think I, I would think that if you're in those, if you're in a situation like that, which is very possible, um, just the fact that you had the emotional intelligence yourself is going to help you navigate that relationship better than if you didn't. Excellent. Well, let's, uh, see here who we got, uh, Isaac, I see you on there. Uh, why don't you share what your thoughts were on the presentation? What do you What are you thinking as you've um, you know, or I, any questions or thoughts? I don't have any questions at the moment, but I, I really thought it was a great presentation. You know, I, I've oh, heard good. a lot uh, of this you. stuff. Yeah, you did. You did an awesome job. I I've heard a lot of the stuff before, but it's nice to get okay. a refresher um, oh, and just kind of go more into detail. Um, especially about that, um, that pie chart that you had. Yeah. Was it, was 58% of interaction with leadership is face to face. Right. Um, I know with, with all this COVID stuff, a lot of my classes are in person 
and then some are online. And I definitely prefer the ones in person because of that reason. You know, I really like that that space, um, just kind of filling up that space, actually. Um, yeah, that's the, an excellent that, point. Mm -hmm, that pie chart really, really put into, into perspective and that research. Uh, who, who was the guy that did that? Uh, Dan Goldman. Yeah, yeah, Goldman. Um, his research just really brought it into perspective of how important this really is. Great. Good. Thanks, Isaac. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. I appreciate You're welcome. it. Uh, Michael, why don't we hear from you? What were your thoughts? Well, hey, Kyle. How Isaac, you doing? Hey, hi. Uh, it's going pretty good. <clears throat> um, yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't as concentrated right at the first few minutes. Uh, but that's yeah, okay. Like, like Isaac, this is... Um, <sighs> Yeah, I've seen, I, I've, I've went over uh, this a number of times. Emotional intelligence, is a, it's, all, it's great to have refreshers. Uh, I need them. A lot of repetition for me to learn well um, and to really implement or, or practice these things. Uh, that seems like really the, uh, our, our big key is awareness and thinking about my thoughts and my feelings. Yeah, you really bring up a good point because a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I'd like to be better at uh, emotional intelligence. I'd like to be a better listener. Or I'd like to, uh, you know, communicate more with people. And what I have found in working with people is that uh, those are great intentions, but you've got to really be specific about what it is you're going to do. So if you say, well, I want to be a better listener. Well, what are you going to actually do to make that happen? Okay, I'm going to read a book. I'm going to take a workshop. You know, whatever it is, I would just encourage uh, all of you that are that are on this, if you if anything around emotional intelligence or what I've shared with you today, and you thought, well, that, you know, I'd like to do better with that. Jot down a few thoughts about some specifics about what it is you could do to be better at that because um, the world is paved with with good intentions, right? Yeah, yeah, Kyle. I do. I do have a question um, about. <clears throat> we kind of reviewed. You know, it's important to get in in touch with our own. You know, emotional intelligence as far as our intrapersonal um, awareness and uh, on our thoughts and feelings, um, and then and leadership style. I think that was the slide it was on, but yeah, I think you had mentioned, yeah. So we want to be in touch uh, and, and grow our emotional intelligence, be in touch with our thoughts and feelings. Um, but then we want to, we want to morph or change and do what's, what works for other people. Well, I, you know what? I'm glad you brought that up. Let me, let me clarify that. Um, so let me give you an example. So let's say, uh, Michael, have you taken like uh Myers Briggs or Strength Finders or it's been a while. Okay, well, I so let's just say you you've taken one of those assessments. What I was really saying there is what a lot of people do is they'll read the assessment and they'll go, "Yep, yeah, that's me." They got it, and that's as far as it goes. And I I think with when you learn information about that you learn more about yourself, it should help you then be able to, to uh, tune in better to other people. But ultimately the value is to now take that knowledge and flex it. So you, it, the mistake is I'm gonna just deal with things the way I'm comfortable dealing with it because you might be pounding a, a, a round peg into a square hole you want to take that information and use it to say, okay, as a manager or leader, what's my desired outcome? What do I know about how I'm going to approach this? What do I know about how this other person's going to approach this? And what do I want to do in terms of how to navigate this situation to get the desired outcome? Because that's the goal. Does that help explain yeah. that a little bit better? Yeah. And what I, what I ultimately wanted to ask was for uh, an example, like, can, can we get a concrete example um, of how that might play out either at work or school? Um, 
Sure. So let's say you're, uh, yeah, no, good question. So let's say, let's say you're not a detail oriented person and you are trying to get somebody bought in on something that you want to accomplish at work and they are a detail oriented person. Now you might say to yourself, oh, well, duh, I need to show more details. Most people won't. They'll just do what they're comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with details, so I'm not going to bother with, with going down the detail path. But if you know that other person's detailed, then you're going to have to address that in some way. So that's just a very simplistic example, but it sort of gives you the idea of how do I better understand, how do I take that information and use it essentially to my advantage to get the desired outcome? I want to get this person bought in. And I know they're a detail-oriented individual. So I'm going to have to meet them where they're at in some way, shape, or form to overcome that or to get them on board with what I want done. Okay. Yeah, and my yeah. thoughts maybe are that details aren't that important. And, uh, and I recognize that they like details, but I, I feel, you know, I'm uncomfortable about diving in that deep and uh, specifically but uh, I'm also aware of what I want and what we're trying to do together. And um, exactly. right. So I can sit with that. I can just recognize that, sit with it and move forward um, in the discomfort to get the desired outcome. That's right. That's uh, right. You nailed it. Rock and roll. Thanks. Isaac, you have your hand up. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry, it took me a while to get off that. Um, Mr. Berger, I do have another question for you. Um, with this emotional intelligence stuff, I know I've been working on this personally for the last four years throughout high school. Um, but sometimes I just feel like it's not enough. You know, how can you get over that roadblock of I'm getting there? It's not there yet, but I need that support and motivation. How? How do you get through that personal motivation roadblock is what I'm trying to ask. Motivation to continue down the path of working on this? Yeah, yeah, trying to reach that goal. Um, sometimes I know it can feel unattainable and it's just out of your reach. Um, how, do you, how do you really measure that? Well, I think you, maybe you don't get too hung up on that. It's more of a journey. And the thing that you say to yourself is, the more I learn about this, the better off I'm going to be. And there's really no downside to it as far as I can see. Uh, it's going to help you in your relationships with other people. And it's going to help you, um, it, you know, at work and at home and in your personal life. So I think it's good. Um, you know, if, if you're concerned about, well, am I making progress or where, where, where could I look to? I did mention that uh, uh, Emotional Intelligence 2.0 book. There is an assessment as part of that when you buy that book um, that's pretty easy to use and I think could give you some helpful information on how to move forward if that's something you wanted to consider, so. There are also, I'll jump in really quick. There are, um, I think the fact that you started working on this in high school is awesome. Um, and then as a student at UWM, there are some resources as well and I'll include those in the follow-up email. There's. Um, student involvement does strength strength finders um, workshops where you actually take that the Clifton strength finders assessment and then they kind of walk you through what your strengths mean and how they might show up in your life. Um, so that's a really good one and I think that will just get you in the habit then um, like Kyle mentioned during his presentation of just using taking advantage of things that are offered to you starting in college and then as you move into your career if a, a workshop is offered or, um, you know, different professional development um, opportunities come about, just taking, grabbing hold of those, because those are going to help to continue to self, you know, that self-development, um, which will make all of this obviously, like, fall into place a little bit better, so. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is it's sort of a long-term, long-term, short-term. So, in the short-term, it may take some time and effort to get better at this, but in the long term, you're going to be way better off. Um, so people that skip over it usually, 
usually that will come back, <laughs> you know, in, in the long run, it will, it will cost you more time down the path. So I don't know, Dorothy, I think you had your mic off. I don't know if you're there anymore, but if you had a question yeah, or anybody had, else. She had wrote in the chat um, for ideas. Oh, how to effectively elicit, thank you, yeah, uh, yeah. Michael. How to effectively elicit feedback from people, especially subordinates or students. Good question. Um, well, I think that comes from building a relationship. So you, first of all, you, you, you know, you've got to develop a relationship with a person and have a certain amount of comfort level and, and trust with them. Um, but one thing I would say is, you know, maybe if there's something you want to be specific about. So let's say For example, I was coaching somebody and she said, I really struggle when I'm in group meetings to speak up and share what's on my mind effectively. So what I do is I just don't say anything. And then afterwards I say, well, I should have said these three things and I didn't do it. So I said, well, do you, to her, do you have a mentor or somebody that you trust at work that could give you feedback on this? So the way you could do is you go to that person and say, hey, you know, this is something I'm really trying to work on. Um, as you observe this, or as I make efforts to speak up in these situations, could you let me know, uh, you know, how that how that is coming across and how that's working and give me feedback on it? Most people are going to say yes to that. Um, so I think that's one way. First of all, it is a leap of faith. You do, you, you know, um, but it's a good leap of faith to take. You do want to get feedback because that's, you, you're only going to recognize so much to yourself. So to have people you can trust, and that's why it's very important once you start your careers and you get into a company to uh, establish mentor relationships. Somebody you can trust that'll give you uh, the skinny you know, give you this, give you this straight up, uh, because that's what, you, you know, that's what you want. That's what you need. And so if you have somebody like that, then you can go to them and say, hey, I'm trying to work on this, or I, I want to better communicate um, in these situations. Give me feedback. How can I, you know, what have you observed? Or, or let me know as these situations come up, if you feel like I'm not hitting the mark, give me the feedback. And then I think part of that, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, is a willingness to take that feedback and not get defensive and that grow from it. I mean, great. I think a lot of times it's, there's an unwillingness to take feedback and grow, actually grow from it. Um, and that leads, that leads, that's just creating another roadblock block for yourself. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the worst thing you can do is ask for feedback and then get defensive about it. Because, um, <laughs> you know, people, uh, even if, if, if somebody, let me do it this way. If you're managing people or, or you're working with somebody and they come to you and they, and they give you feedback, even if you don't agree with it, even if you think it's way off the mark, you still want to be gracious. You still want to accept the feedback. Here's why. If you get defensive and you shut it down, that's not good for you because you want to know what these other people are thinking. Because what did I say earlier? Perception is reality. So you want to have you want to have an idea of what's going on in their head and what they're thinking. So um, sometimes you may have to you know grin and bear it, but um, I think you're always better off to do that and to be gracious about it than get get defensive because you want especially if you have people reporting to you if they've got something that they're not happy with you about you want to know about that a lot of people don't but that's a big mistake because i'll tell you what it, it's it's going to be there regardless so you might as well have that communication open to know yeah the last thing you want is a team that's completely shut down that no one, and you're not going to meet any, any ends with a team that is shut down and won't communicate with you. So. Exactly. 
I have a question about nonverbal cues. So you mentioned that nonverbal our nonverbal communication is like 90% of our communication. Um, any suggestions for how to communicate nonverbally in a digital world when you're not when you're not sitting in the union working in a, on a team project together, um, when you're communicating more over email or Teams chat or things like that than you are than you would be under normal circumstances. Any suggestions for that? Well, I mean, this is nothing earth shattering, I would say here to that question, but I think it is a, is a good point, and that is, you want to get as close to it as you can. So, um, if you're if you're engaging with people over Teams or over um, uh, Zoom or any of those technologies, leverage the full technology. So have the camera on so they can see you, you can see them. Um, that's the closest you're going to get, mm -hmm. right, in the world we're living in now. Um, I get asked a lot about, you know, now that people are working from home, well, what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, if you are working in an office and now everybody goes to working from home, there's a drop off in communication. The, the hallway conversation, the let's, mm -hmm. let's have a quick meeting and resolve this, that all is gone. Yeah. So you have to take the initiative to fill in that gap. So it, it's, it is about leveraging technology like this, and it is about trying to get it as close to the in-person as you can. Um, I think that's the best approach to take. Excellent. What other questions are out there in the group? Or experiences with emotional intelligence, perhaps, and you didn't realize <laughs> what it was that you were experiencing. Anyone want to share? Well, I can't reiterate enough to not find yourself in a job interview um, hearing the term emotional intelligence for the first time, which of course now none of you will, but that happened to me and I was like 34. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I highly recommend, um, you know, taking advantage of the resources that we'll include in the follow-up email. Um, if you are a current student, the resources that are on campus, um, and if not, you know, if not on campus, you know, look into your workplace. I think even now in the virtual world, there's even more opportunities for professional development because they're being offered via webinar and and things like that, which are less expensive for um, for companies and more readily available. So um, if you are working, um, ask your supervisor, ask your boss if there's anything extra you can be doing or if there's, um, I know LinkedIn has great webinars on, on these type of topics. Um, so really dig around and look into that. Um, I will also include some resources in in the follow-up email I send out later this week. So, um, and I'm gonna just open up the floor one more time for any other questions. Abby, what what is uh what what does emotional intelligence mean to you? Now. So oh gosh, putting me on the spot, guys. Michael. <laughs> um, so it turns out like I'm so I did this the Clifton Strength Finders, and my number one strength is empathy. Um, and I've always considered myself an empath and. Um, I'm incredibly in tuned into other people's feelings, but I didn't know that that was a thing. I didn't know that emotional intelligence was a skill that I could hone and that I could build. And I've always prided myself. In fact, on my resume, one of my number one skills is the ability to form meaningful relationships with people. But I didn't know that it was a thing. I didn't know that it was an actual, like, you know, scientific and quantifiable, like, skill that I could possess. Um, so when it came up in a job interview about three years ago, when I was actually moving to Milwaukee from Chicago, um, it kind of sparked my interest in, in the topic. And I began to actually look into it. And now I can, 
now in other conversations, both personal and professional, I can use language around emotional intelligence to describe myself and my working style. And it's, I think, made me more marketable as an employee. I think it's also made me just more like, I understand better where my relationships like stem from um, in my personal life and my professional life. So um, it means a lot to me. It's, it's really very important to me. Um, and my relationships are really important to me. Um, and I asked my first question because I do struggle in my workplace having those relationships reciprocated. Um, and that is kind of an ongoing mm. struggle for me. Um, well, you know, it's interesting, Abby, because, um, and Eleanor, I don't know if you had a question and we can certainly, if you do, we can, but I, I think, um, you know, empathy is definitely a strength, right? And you have it and that's great, mm -hmm. but it, it, it can be a double-edged sword a little bit. Yes, it can. So that's part of understanding it too. Yep. Is when, you know, is there a tipping point where this strength can become counterproductive? And or I'm too is, invested. Is, <laughs> yeah. And so what, how do I manage that too? That's also Absolutely. part of it. Yeah. So Eleanor, did you have a question? Because I saw you had unmuted before. Um, I really have a question, but just hearing everything is really great. And I am about to graduate. So I know, Abby, you mentioned that you got hit with it in interviews. Like, give me an, an example of your emotional intelligence. <laughs> It was truly that, say... that was the question that was posed to me. It was, what was the question, okay. Abby? What was it? It was It was truly like, so give me some examples of your emotional intelligence. And I was like, <laughs> oh, shoot. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ellen. So, yeah, you... I guess what would be like a good example or would you want to hear like a specific situation? I, I think how they'll do it, they may not be as uh, as overt as they were in your situation, Abby. What they might do is say, Eleanor, they might say, and this this is fishing in a way for emotional intelligence. They might say, well, tell us about a time where you had a conflict with somebody you worked with and mm -hmm. how did you resolve that and what was the outcome of it? And you definitely want to have a good example that you could share. Okay. So that would be a way that they would, they wouldn't come out and say, tell me, you know, your, but they'll ask questions that'll get at it. Yeah. And you would want to try to highlight your Clifton number one strength, because that is what makes you such a strong, intelligent worker. Well, and the question I gave you, um, or the question hypothetical that I gave, I think in that situation, you'd probably as you answer that, you would want to think about a situation that where there may have been some confusion or some breakdown of, of communication. And how did you address that to, I'm, I'm just spitballing here. How did you yeah. address that to better learn that, you know, I, I did this to learn their perspective. Once I learned their perspective, I did this and we solved the problem. That makes okay. sense. Yeah, that does. Thank you. Yeah, and Victoria just put into the um, chat that we're seeing more and more interviewers um, using scenarios as opposed to like those traditional interview questions. It's more like, you know, you and Jessica have, you know, some kind of conflict, like tell us how you would, you know, um, so I think interviewers are definitely, the interview that I referenced, it was kind of a strange interview. You probably won't hear the words emotional intelligence right. in the interview, but you will get asked scenario questions that really um, get to it. Get to it. Yes. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know, some people list strengths right on their resume. I, I really play into what, you know, my strengths are. So empathy, communication, um, relational, like those are, those are the strengths that I have found through different assessments that I possess. And so I try to find ways to point those out without being too obvious, um, or too overt. Um, and then obviously finding examples of how those strengths have, have come in, um, handy in my career. So. Yeah. I always think it's good to look at like, what, what is the job you're applying for? 
Mm. And what about that job really excites you? You know, and can you highlight that and, and help them understand that that really, this is why I'm here. I'm really. Yep. And depending on the sense? field that you're going into, if you're going into a more, um, say a more uh, artistic field, like your graphic designer or marketing or things like that, you know, look at the culture of the company and what aspects of the culture of the company really also inspire you and, and make you passionate. If you're in a more technical field, it, it might be different. If you're going into engineering or, um, you know, computer sciences or something, there might be some different um, things there, but really look to at the culture of the company, research the, um, the website and really like see what, um, you know, company culture is a big thing now as well. And that, I think that also plays to emotional intelligence. Well, and you're right. And I think uh, to add on to that, if you research the company and they do have a really strong culture, then understand that they're part of the interview process will be they're assessing how you will fit with that culture. Absolutely. So know that going in. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got the emotional intelligence. We've got you guys all figured out for the interviews. You're going to get great <laughs> jobs now. Um, I, I mean, we've solved a lot in less than an hour. Is all it yeah, <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Um, yeah. But I really you. appreciate everybody's time. I would say for any of you, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, it's Kyle. Uh, the last name is, it's, it's Berger, but it's got the German spelling, B-U-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E um, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks for setting this up, Abby. Of course. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you um, to everyone who participated. Um, like I said, later this week, you're going to get a follow-up email from me. I'll include a link to Kyle's LinkedIn, um, the recording of today's presentation, as well as a survey. The survey will literally take you like three minutes. So please, um, please take that and fill in what other kinds of topics you'd like to hear about so that I can set up really, you know, good and meaningful um, virtual events for us for the rest of this school year. So um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions after, if you are thinking about this later and you have any questions, um, my email will also be in that uh, follow-up email message. So you're welcome to reach out to me. So um, thank you all. Have a great rest of your afternoon and go Panthers. Thank you very much, Abby and Kyle. I appreciate it. Thank you're you. Welcome. Hey, um, Kyle, before you leave, actually, um, while you were